Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be talking dollars and cents. What should you pay to turbocharge your vehicle, or more specifically, what exactly did I pay to turbocharge Ugly Truck, the 2000 Chevy Silverado 1500 that I 8.1 swapped and then built a custom S480 single turbo kit on. Now, last time you guys saw this truck, we just got it off the dyno where it made 483 horsepower and 619 pounds of torque at the rear wheels. And there's two questions that you guys have asked me probably a hundred times. Number one, why'd you stop there? That doesn't seem like a whole lot of horsepower. Well, I'm pretty conservative in the tuning right now because I have no idea what this stock bottom end 8.1 is going to hold up to. If you believe what you read on the internet, just about everybody says these 8.1s are pretty fragile. The stock pistons just aren't going to hold up to a whole lot of abuse. So uh, we stopped at eight pounds of boost. We had about 11 degrees of timing and a 10 and a half to one air fuel ratio, which is really rich, but it's also really conservative and really safe. So that's just kind of the short answer. It's a good safe spot to stop. And we've got over 600 pounds of torque at the wheels, which is more than enough on these junky stock tires that I have for now. Second question you guys have asked me a million times is why didn't I gap the stock rings? Because it's almost like I forgot that you could do that. <laughs> That's a little bit of sarcasm there, but you guys have asked me that a lot and I've answered this a lot, but I'm going to answer it one more time. The reason why I haven't gapped the stock rings is because of how much work it's going to take. Now, I'm not afraid of doing the work, but here's the deal. To gap the rings, basically you need to take the engine out of the truck, completely disassemble the engine down to nothing. Take the pistons and rods out of the block, take the rings off the pistons, and then grind a small, minute amount of material away from the ring gap to open them up a little bit so they don't butt together under boost. Now, in theory, yes, that's gonna help those pistons hold up because if the rings butt together, they're gonna disintegrate the pistons and we don't want that to happen, but, even if I go through all that work to gap the rings, I have a final horsepower goal of 1,000 at the rear wheels. And there's no way the stock pistons are gonna hold up to that much power, no matter how big the ring gap is. So I'm still gonna to have to rebuild the engine the same exact process once again and later on. And the plan is to do it this summer. You know, forged pistons, forged rods, and possibly even a different crankshaft. And then of course, cylinder heads, camshaft, and all the other supporting mods that you're gonna to have to do. So anyway, Today we're going to be talking the dollars and cents, what it costs to turbo this thing, and then we're going to have a discussion about the differences between turbocharging this big block and an LS. You're not going to want to miss it, so let's dive right in. So jumping right in, if you're going to throw a turbo onto your truck, you kind of got to be prepared for the big ticket items. I mean, obviously the turbo, the wastegate, the intercooler, the injectors, all that stuff is going to add up in a hurry. But don't forget about all the little stuff too, because that'll almost kind of, you know, nickel and dime you to death. Just the little fittings, all the hoses, all the couplers, the clamps, all that stuff, it carries a price tag. Now, if you're buying a turbo kit, something that's, you know, pre-designed or pre-engineered, it saves you a lot of hassle just because the kit obviously will or should come with everything that you need. But if you're kind of doing it like I did, just a one-off kit, you've got to buy all those individual parts and components one at a time. Like I said, just be prepared to open your wallet for the nickel and dime stuff. Now, in terms of the price range that I went with, I didn't go all out. I tried, because obviously it's money coming out of my own pocket, I tried to be pretty middle of the road in terms of quality. Um, certain stuff I got from Amazon. In fact, I got a lot of stuff from Amazon. You can actually get some really good brands on there. And then I got some other stuff from, you know, the big retailers, you know, the Summit, the Jags, the places like that. Um, so let's just jump right in. I got my cheat sheet here and I'll kind of put a graphic up on the screen for you guys to check out. In terms of big ticket items, you know, we've got the Turbo. That's a VS Racing S480. That guy right there, 790 bucks. Um, VS Racing blow-off valve and wastegate, $139 and $63 respectively. And actually the second most expensive item of this whole kit was the intercoolers. One of those Trick Turbo Monster 3-inch intercoolers. By the time it got to my door with shipping and everything, $750. Bucks. So what I call the big ticket items, grand total, $1,746. Now, that's actually not too bad considering certain ball bearing turbos. You could actually spend a lot more than 1700 bucks on just the turbo itself. So we're not off to a bad start. 
The second most expensive category of this whole build actually kind of took me by surprise, and that was the fabrication materials for building just the hot side. I'm talking about all the pipes and flanges, both stainless steel and mild steel, that it took to build the exhaust manifold and the crossover. There's several different V-bands. There's a couple of big flanges, like for the T6 Turbo. There's one on the driver's side, and then just the heavy pipe. That stuff, you know, it might only be 30 or 40 bucks per band, but again, it does add up in a hurry. So in terms of fabrication materials for just the hot side, we come in at $896. And really the big items in that group, we've got you know the Schedule 40 pipe, I've got about 200 bucks just in Schedule 40 pipe. And then the second most expensive was the stainless steel, the four inch that goes from the down pipe. I had to buy one of those vibrant U slash J bends, and then just a straight four inch section to connect to the rest of the exhaust. So that was like another $203 there. So again, all in, just fabrication materials for the hot side stuff only, $896. So the next category I'm lumping together is cold side piping. It basically starts right there at the compressor discharge, that V-band, includes all the materials to get the charge air from the turbo down along the front and to the intercooler, which by the way is now nicely hidden that we've painted it black. Um, doesn't include the price of the intercooler itself, we already grabbed that, but the aluminum tubes that run up in between the cooling fan and the engine, uh, not the blow off valve, not the IAT, but it does include the price of the bung. Uh, again, couplers, clamps, and all the welding materials. Just about everything on the cold side for pipes I got from CX Racing in a single order, and that one came in at, I think, $385. And the rest of the 60 bucks was basically just that one cast aluminum 90 degree elbow that connects to the V-band on the compressor outlet, which I actually had to modify and make a straight elbow. So all in, $445. No matter how cheap or expensive your turbo is, it's not going to last very long unless it's properly lubricated. So the next category I've got is just talking about things that get oil from the engine to the turbo and then back to the engine again. And in my case, it starts all the way back on the driver's side of the block down by the oil filter uh, down below there. It includes things like the pipe thread to AN adapter, the braided AN line that runs underneath the engine and feeds oil into the turbo, the drain flanges, the dash 10 line that drains the oil back, which you can kind of barely see down down there below the boost controller. And then finally, the weld bung, which you probably can't see, that's attached to the oil pan. Uh, definitely not the most expensive category, but probably one of the more important ones. All in, 124 bucks for all the lines and fittings to get oil from the engine to the turbo and then back to the engine again. And now we've got to talk about fuel. Typically, you know, the fuel system is not part of building a turbo kit, but you definitely need to upgrade your fuel system if you're going to go from NA to turbo because you're pumping a lot more air and you need a lot more fuel to go with that extra air. The biggest single item in the fuel system is the injector. So I'm running FIC 1000cc injectors. And yes, you can get a lot cheaper injectors, but I didn't really want to go cheap on the injector route just because it's, in my opinion, one of the more critical things to having your tune be reliable, you know, making sure the injectors deliver exactly what they're supposed to when they're supposed to. But anyway, that's a whole other conversation, but the injectors cost me shipped to the door $790. And that includes the adapters to go from the LS to the new style plug that's on the injector, which I think is like the LS2 style. Other than the injectors, the next items in the fuel system, we've got the Racetronics hot wire kit to deliver, you know, the right amount of voltage into the tank, all the little harness adapters, you know, that stuff, uh, the little braided fuel line that's inside the tank. Uh, from Racetronics, that order cost me $122. The Walbro 450, that was $140. And then I had 20 bucks for a fuel rail spacer kit because new injectors, they're just a little bit taller and I wanted to maintain the same height as I had before. So fuel system all in. $1,072. The category of miscellaneous does include a lot of things which are specific to the way that I've set up this 8.1 swap and then turboed it. You know, things like the radiator cap adapter that I welded into the thermostat outlet, the coolant overflow tank, the oil catch can, which not that oil catch can, but the one I bought to replace it, which I haven't put in yet. Then we've got the inlet air temperature sensor down there, the wiring harness that adapts it, the GM three bar map sensor that's in the top of the intake manifold. And then I even included the consumables that it takes to actually build the kit, you know, sandpaper, flap wheels, cutoff discs, argon. I mean, it's like 75 bucks for a bottle of argon to get filled up. And then just a couple other odds and ends. So the grand total of the miscellaneous category, $565. You gotta watch out for the little things. Like I said, it's nickel and dime and it will add up. 
So all in, the grand total of everything that it costs to turbocharge this 8.1 swap truck and to bring it to 480, however many horsepower and pounds of torque I said it made, uh, $4,848. That's all in, that's the grand total, that's everything I added up. I sat down for like an hour before I made this video just to kind of go through all my old invoices, all my old receipts, and there's a million little things, 4,848 bucks. Now, to kind of compare that to like, say, um, a pre-built turbo kit for, I mean, obviously there are no pre-built 8.1 turbo kits, but let's say you have a, an LS Silverado, and this is a nice transition into the next dis discussion that we're gonna have, but some turbo kits you can buy for a lot less money than $4,848, but also there are some turbo kits out there that do cost a lot more than $4,848. So in terms of how much money it costs to turbo your car or truck, it does add up. The one thing to remember is if you look at all the big items like the turbo, the intercooler, you know, the wastegate, the blow-off valve, all that stuff's pretty cheap. You know, that category, remember, it's only 1746 bucks, but as all the other supporting parts that you have to buy, the flanges, the materials, you know, the welding things that you need to get and to build your turbo setup, that stuff does add up. Okay, so let's talk about the elephant in the room, big block versus LS. Almost immediately after I dropped the last upload onto YouTube, I had a couple of people directly message me and reach out and say, hey, tell me, is it worth it to swap into big block and then do some sort of a power rider? And I had the same question asked a lot of times back when I did the final video on the NA 8.1 build. And my answer is still the same. No, totally not. It's not worth it in terms of money to swap in a big motor like an 8.1, especially one that might not be supported quite so well on the aftermarket like the LS's are. But that's not why I did it. I didn't do it for the most affordable or the cheapest way to make horsepower because all day long the LS platform is king. I mean, I bought this truck for 2,700 bucks back at the beginning of last year. I could have gone and slapped a big giant turbo on the thing and made more power than I'm making now for a whole lot less money. But remember, the old timers say, there's no replacement for displacement. And that fact still holds true even in this case. But to illustrate my point, you've got to have kind of an apples to apples comparison. Now I'm gonna use two vehicles that I've owned, one ugly truck that I have right now, and one, a 2010 Silverado I built several years ago at my other job, uh, and that was a 5.3 with a cam, a single 76 millimeter turbo, and coincidentally, they are both running at eight pounds of boost. Now, it's not exactly the same thing, but it's the closest thing that I have to an apples to apples comparison. So let's talk numbers. The 5.3 with a 214, 228 cam at eight pounds of boost made at the rear wheels, 498 horsepower, 6,000 RPM, and 481 pounds of torque at 5,200. Compared to my dyno numbers for the ugly truck turbo big block 483.619, the 5.3 made 15 horsepower more at the rear wheels on a similar boost level, or exactly the same boost level, but torque. It made 138 pounds of torque less than the turbo 8.1. And that's again, at the same boost level. Well, let's talk about RPM. The 5.3 made its peak power at 6,000 RPM, where the 8.1 makes its peak power at, if you can read my handwriting, 4,250 RPM. And then the peak torque on the 5.3 was at 5,200 compared to 4,000 RPM on the 8.1. So I'm not trying to convince you guys that the 8.1 is a superior engine to the LS because, I mean, let's face the facts. The 8.1s are kind of rare. They're expensive to buy. They're not supported on the aftermarket the same way that the LSs are. And then stock for stock, they're definitely not as strong as some of the LS stuff is. So just on those merits alone, yeah, the 8.1 is not a great engine from a high performance standpoint, but it still does have its place and it still does kind of prove the point that there's no replacement for displacement. And yes, I know that's an old school saying, but it holds true because the bigger your engine is, the more capacity it has to make horsepower because the more air you can pack into those cylinders, the more horsepower you're gonna produce. Now, the one interesting thing to this whole comparison, again, is the power band or the RPM range at which that 8.1 makes its power. And it's got a really, really strong mid-range where my old 5.3 truck, the mid-range wasn't quite so good. You had to lean into it a lot harder and let the engine downshift or the transmission downshift and raise the RPMs so the truck could accelerate a little bit quicker. Now, here's an idea. If you live anywhere near Salt Lake City, or if you know somebody who does and who also has a turbo truck, whether that's an LS, 
you know, a Ford, whatever you have. I'd like to do a side-by-side -side acceleration contest, you know, just for fun, just to kind of illustrate the difference and see if, you know, this turbo truck is worth, you know, <laughs> worth anything, if it's worth all this effort that I put into it. I'd like to do a side-by-side -side contest, just kind of see what happens. So drop a comment down below, tag your friend or anybody that you do know. Like I said, let's line them up and just kind of see what happens. Now, I want to say thank you guys for watching. I appreciate each and every one of you. I honestly do. I'm having a blast making this content, and I'm glad that Ugly Truck, at least this middle intermediate stage, has kind of reached a conclusion because uh, I've got some more stuff to do on the Suburban, like I mentioned earlier, and I can't wait to get started on it. So drop a comment down below. Let me what, know what you think in terms of 8.1 versus LS stuff. Hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll catch you guys on the next upload.